Welcome to the Smoke Pit. Now, I know that you came here for entertainment, but as this is a new feature for the channel, before I begin, I would like to answer a few questions that you might have while you listen to the stories shared here, and those in future episodes. What are Smoke Pit stories? Where do these stories come from, and how can I share my own? And how do we know these stories are true? After this video, this introduction will not be included in each consecutive episode, but will be linked as a separate video for the sake of any newcomers. I simply want to manage your possible expectations and establish the guidelines for these particular episodes moving forward. And if none of this matters to you, you are of course welcome to skip the introduction. The actual stories for this video begin at timestamp 4 minutes and 40 seconds. So, what are smoke pit stories? A smoke pit is something of a military term, and smoke pits come in many forms, but the gist remains the same. It does not discriminate against either active duty service members, veterans, or civilians. It is a place for warfighters from all walks of life to gather, to unwind, and to swap stories. As I work to produce each next primary episode, which unfortunately takes some time due to the extensive amount of work required for the writing, audio, and animations, rather than keep you waiting in silence for several weeks between episodes, I can only hope these short stories, which take far less time to create, offer some amount of supplemental entertainment. Where do these stories come from? The stories herein are those shared by fellow viewers from around the world, like yourself. Those stories brought to mind while they listened to stories on the channel, and then either emailed them to me or posted them in the comment section. If I miss seeing your comment or it does not appear in the most recent Smoke Pit episode, I might be saving it for a future video, or perhaps it was too general and did not include enough detail. You are certainly encouraged to repost your story in the comments of a future video, or email it to me if you feel like it might have been overlooked. Lastly, and most importantly, due to the often unusual nature of the stories in these episodes, I understand that much of the intrigue of listening to these stories comes from the assertion that they are true. So, how do we know that these stories are true? I consider the truth to be invaluable, yes. Unless otherwise indicated, all of the stories presented on wartime stories are true to the best of my knowledge, even the recent Fort Campbell stories. I assure you, it is not my intention to fool anyone into believing anything. There is more than enough of that in the world already. Admittedly, as the Kitsune episode is so far the only fictional story presented on the channel, I did a poor job of conveying that it was always meant to be a fictional story, or rather a hypothetical situation which combined real wartime events on Okinawa during the Vietnam War, along with real Japanese superstitions that date back hundreds if not thousands of years. So again, from this point, I will make it clear in the episode itself if a story is known to be a work of fiction. There will likely be few, if any, as there are plenty of true stories left to tell, but I would hate to limit myself because a lot of people enjoy the Kitsune story, and who knows what might come along in future. However, for these smoke pit stories, it should be obvious that these sorts of individual accounts shared by viewers are very difficult, if not impossible, for me to verify. So, either I can take my viewers at their word and share their story, or not. And who am I to say that the tree didn't make a sound, simply because I wasn't there to hear it fall? Of course, it should also be obvious that I do not want anyone submitting a fabricated story and presenting it as being true. But I can't stop that from happening. And if it does, well, I suppose that person will just have to live with the guilt of knowing the truth. And ultimately, whether you find these stories incredibly fantastic or not, no one can ever take away your freedom to think for yourself, to choose what you are willing to believe is possible. This channel was not created to ridicule others for sharing their experiences. We tell stories here. As for me, in spite of my own skepticism, I am inclined to believe that the world is far more mysterious than we give it credit for. Welcome to the Smoke Pit. If you haven't watched the Fort Campbell episodes yet, I should warn you that this episode will contain spoilers, as these stories are those that fellow viewers submitted in response to hearing those of a U.S. Army veteran's various encounters while working with the military police on Fort Campbell, Kentucky in the 1980s. 
As there were a number of various stories submitted, this episode will focus specifically on those I would call on Earth, meaning those experiences which took place on the ground. There will be more episodes to follow which address those stories of things seen in the sky, such as UFOs, and something else entirely, such as encounters with spiritual entities. While not all of these stories take place on Fort Campbell, nor do they all involve encounters with something like the large humanoid creature that Robert saw, many of our Kentucky locals who shared their thoughts in the comments section seem to share a collective sense that their state is a very strange place to live. And among those that have commented about spending time in and around Fort Campbell, especially at night, many of them seem to have also experienced a sense that something about the area is very unsettling. The following story was submitted by Jacob Kalam, or Callum. I'm not a serviceman, but my dad was. We were stationed at Fort Campbell from about 1997 to 2006. We had just moved there from Germany. Me and my family had a number of unexplained and supernatural events happen to us during that time, but there were a couple that were particularly terrifying. We lived in Woodlawn, about 10 minutes from one of the back gates at Campbell, the one heading towards the Hunter's Lodge and where the golf course is. One morning, our dad woke us up at about 3 or 4. He had to be at work early that morning for some kind of battalion run or other unit training event. Since we didn't have a babysitter, he had to take us along with him to work. We would spend the day hanging out in his command building. It was still very dark outside as we drove up what I believe was the 101st Airborne Road to reach one of the base's back entrances. We had just rounded a curve in the road and suddenly saw something up ahead of us. There was an old horse barn near the road. And between the road and the barn, there was something I could initially only describe as a huge person. As we got closer, we could clearly see that it was not a human being. It must have been eight to nine feet tall and covered in hair. Before we reached it, this thing suddenly let out an awful noise, like a shrieking roar or a howl. Then it bolted across the road in front of us before disappearing inside the tree line. It completely freaked us out. And then there was the smell. We were riding in a jeep out in the open air. You ever pass by a dead animal on the side of the road? Well, the smell was awful, like wet, hot garbage. I've got more stories than just that one. On those roads at night, and usually around autumn, it always got more active, and I don't know if it was because all of the deer roaming around, but the Bigfoot activity seemed to always happen to us. I think everyone who's had sightings or encounters like that usually has a level head, and probably just wants to tell someone about it, to see if someone they know has ever had a similar experience, so they don't think they're crazy. The next story was submitted by Julian Medina. I had a strange experience as well on Fort Campbell. It was two weeks ago during our division field training exercises and I was on swing shift, 12 to 12, noon to midnight, doing simple stuff like filling the generators with gas and maintaining other equipment. We must have been 10 minutes away from the main post area, so not that far away, but not close either. Around 11 p.m. I had to go to the Porta Johns, which were a good way down the road from my location, about a 10 minute walk. That particular night, there was limited visibility, with clouds covering the moon and a fog on the ground that stopped me from seeing very far ahead of me, the fog absorbing the red light from my tactical flashlight. Everything was fine, until I started walking past this open field. The field was very large, and through the fog, I could make out a single tree sitting in the middle of it, probably larger than any of the trees in the woods around it. But all of a sudden, for some reason, I suddenly had that weird feeling. I looked around, but couldn't make out anyone on the road ahead of me, or behind me, or anywhere else in the area. But I just couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, and it scared me. It was that fear where you unconsciously try to control your breathing so you can hear better. I switched from my red light to my bright white light and looked around, but couldn't see anything through the fog. I just stood there, frozen, for several more minutes staring out into the fog around me, 
feeling of fear slowly intensifying. And then, all of a sudden, the fear went away. And I no longer felt like I was being watched. The Smoke Pit will be right back after these messages. And now, back to the stories. The following story was submitted by 2112121112. I live about an hour west of Fort Campbell in a rural area. One night, about 3 a.m., my girlfriend and I, along with her two cats and large dog, were woken up by a blood-curdling scream or howl that came from right outside our bedroom window, just to the right of it. Like something was standing beside the window to look in. I've never heard anything like it before or after. I've looked up and listened to every kind of animal howl to see if I could find something similar. I never have. Whatever it was, my girlfriend was shaking. Her cats were so scared they hid and we could smell that they had passed gas. Now, as I was reading his story, being a cat owner myself, I bothered to look this up, and this behavior is known to be part of a cat's, and probably other animals, fight or flight response. I also have the impression that cats and dogs are much more sensitive to possible danger. Back to the story. The dog took its cue from me. <laughs> Hell, I was scared too, but I tried acting like I wasn't, hoping to comfort my girlfriend. She whispered, what time is it? I looked and told her, 3 a.m. She then said that was the dead hour. Hearing her say that didn't help. Then she said it was a demon. That didn't calm me down either. I really didn't want to go up to the window and look out, in case something was there. So I thought, screw this, and figured I'd go around the house to try and see the area outside the window from a better angle. I grabbed my fixed blade buck hunting knife and tucked it into the waistband of my shorts, then motioning for the dog to follow me. I also picked up my bright flashlight and a machete on the way out. I slipped quietly through the house, to the side furthest from our bedroom. I silently opened the door and stepped outside, barefooted, the dog following me as I then moved quickly around the house. Summoning all the courage I had, I was practically running as I rounded the far corner of the house. I hit the strobe on my flashlight, holding my machete in my free hand and shouting as loud as I could, hoping to surprise whatever might be hiding near the window. Nothing was there. I continued around the house in case it had moved around to the other side. I ended up circling the entire house. Still nothing. I shined my light into the woods around the house, thinking I might catch the eyes of some animal reflecting the light. I then looked on the ground around the window, trying to find prints or some other sign of an animal. Still, nothing. I knew we hadn't imagined hearing that scream. So, I went back around and opened the door, and then closed it loudly, hoping that if it was intelligent, whatever it was might think I'd gone back inside. I suppose I really just didn't want to go back to sleep until I knew what it was. So I waited in the shadows, trying to catch any movement around the house. After about 30 minutes, with still no sight of anything unusual, I went back inside. My girlfriend was still awake. She and I talked about what happened for a while until we could get back to sleep. I have no idea what it was beside the window that could make a noise like that. Something that could likely move very silently and very quickly. There are foxes, coyotes, and other animals in the area, but all I can say is, based on the scream we heard, whatever it was, it just sounded like something much bigger. The following story was submitted by Laura Lee, 99. I also experienced something while stationed at Fort Campbell in 2019. While I was on fire guard at night during a training event in a hard site out in the back 40, I heard a noise that sounded like something walking just out of sight. The 
The other soldier who was on shift with me heard it as well. For the next half hour, we stayed close together, trying to convince each other, and ourselves, that the footsteps and yipping sounds we were hearing, coming from just out of view, were coyotes. The following comment was submitted by Texas Johnny Bravo. The back 40 at Fort Campbell always gave me the creeps at night. The roads out there are endless, and they take you to some weird spots. Although I never saw anything while I was out there, it wouldn't surprise me one bit if these stories about people seeing strange things in the area are, in fact, 100% true. Also, as a side note, I've heard a lot of stories about LBL, Land Between the Lakes. It's a heavily forested national recreation area to the west of Fort Campbell. Our battalion had a few mandatory fun days out there. I didn't know it at the time, but apparently that place is also full of stories of creepy stuff. The following comments were submitted by N. Perez, 1986. My stepdad had a similar experience in Fort Benning, Georgia, in the 90s. And by that, I mean that he heard some kind of monstrous howl while he was out in the field. He said it was some kind of animal or being that him and his buddy had never heard before, but it freaked them out. Not until I saw that Fort Campbell episode, it clicked in my mind. Now, I'm currently stationed at Fort Campbell myself. I walked for a few miles alone through the back 40 one night, since I couldn't drive to where I needed to get to. I hadn't heard any stories like this back then. I didn't see anything strange that night, but now, will I ever do that again? Nope. The following story was submitted by El Guapo. I was in the Army in the early 80s. My MOS was 11 Bravo Infantry. I was stationed at Fort Lewis. One evening, out in the field training area, we were conducting a nighttime land navigation exercise, and we had been paired in two-man teams for safety reasons. During that training, a fellow soldier and his battle buddy had been following one of their plotted azimuths, the compass direction from one of their navigation points to the next one. As they walked the straight line through the area, they reached an open clearing. Ahead of them, out in the clearing in the moonlight, they saw what they described as a man-ape. When they later recounted what they saw, I remember one of them was so shook up about it. And I knew him to be a level-headed man that was not known to lie. He was scared. Thank you to those who took the time to share your stories. I did take the liberty of moving some things around and adding clarification here and there, but I hope I did your stories justice. Uh, a huge thank you to my patrons and YouTube channel members. I sincerely appreciate the support, and I will see you in the next episode. Hey guys, just thought I'd sneak another personal message here into the credits. Um, let me know what you thought. Honest thoughts. Good, bad, ugly. Um, subtitles might be something you ask about. Um, I'm probably not going to do those. Those are kind of, you know, because you got to hand jam every single subtitle in there, uh, which is a little bit time intensive. So I'm trying to keep these short and sweet. Um, maybe just something I can get out every week um, between kind of the bigger episodes. Um, but yeah, let me know what your thoughts are. Um, and... Keep sharing the stories. Appreciate it. Take care.